of it already out, some of it in the progress uh, that should be out soon on, um, on the wave function of the universe and scattering amplitudes uh, from a uh, notion of uh, combinatorial geometry at infinity that, uh, that I hope will become clear as we go on. And um, let me uh, remind all of you of uh, something you all know, of sort of a big difference between, uh, between the real world and uh, the world in a tin can that, uh, um, uh, that's been uh, uh, studied so intensely over the last 20 years. So in the ADS-CFT, we have this picture where the observables, like in any theory of gravity uh, of qu uh, that has quantum mechanics and gravity, the, uh, the observables, uh, at least the ones that we know how to talk about, live at infinity, uh, in this case on the walls of the, of the tin can of ADS space. Um, uh, in, in this particular case, uh, uh, time is totally normal. The time that flows on the boundary of the tin can is the same as the time that flows in the interior. Uh, and in this case, we know that there is a way of talking about what these observables are on the boundary without ever talking about the inside. And in some sense, the sort of uh, the, the, the picture is that quantum mechanics or the boundary quantum field theory is king. Uh, and out of the strong dynamics of that uh, quantum field theory, in some regimes, um, you, uh, space emerges, gravity, strings, all the rest of it uh, emerge. And the big difference b between that and reality, um, reality in flat space, or even more so reality in cosmology, uh, is here too we have boundary observables that we can talk about. So in flat space, the boundary observable is the S matrix. Um, in cosmology, the boundary observable is the pompously named wave function of the universe. And let's just uh, remember what we're talking about here. Um, uh, here, uh, we, we are talking about spatial correlations. What the wave function of the universe is, is uh, supposed to compute for us are spatial correlations when the universe becomes infinitely big and the quote-unquote experiments are done in different regions of space an infinite number of times, then if we ignore the fact that the universe is accelerating today that makes everything finite and fuzzy, we imagine that the, that the world opened up an infinitely flat space, then this is the analog of the, uh, of the uh, S matrix. Okay? It's just, uh, but now it only depends on, on variables on uh, the future spatial surface uh, at infinity. And in both of these cases, the problem is that unlike the boundary of ADS, there's no obvious theory to put on the boundary. There's no obvious notion of time, nor an obvious notion of locality. Um, but you can still ask, what kind of question should you ask on the boundary whose answer produces something as, uh, with all the richness and complexity of scattering amplitudes or the wave function of the universe? And uh, this is a, this is a speculative picture, but it's a picture that uh, many friends and I have been developing for, the, for over 10 years now, is that what we should be looking for is not something where quantum mechanics in ki is king and space emerges from it, but that some other ideas are more primitive. And somehow, uh, these observables that both have a quantum mechanical and a space-time interpretation come out, uh, joined at the hip from these more primitive ideas. Okay. So in the context, so let me just say again, I'm just going to say this. Uh, the, the strategy and the question in a number of different ways and then uh, get to the more recent <coughs> pictures in cosmology that have been uh, emerging associated with it. So for instance, if you talk about scattering amplitudes, you're an experimentalist at the LHC. You wake up in the morning, you collide particles, you go get your espresso, you come back in the afternoon and a bunch of particles went out. Um, you're not inside the proton. You have no idea that what happened in there is that a bunch of quarks hit each other and hit gluons and so on. Okay, all you see is the input and the output. And the question is, um, how do you know that what happened in, so, so you can ask what happened in there? What happened in there to give rise to the pattern of, uh, of uh, probabilities or amplitudes ultimately for the, uh, for the processes? And the usual picture is to fill in the inside of this question mark with local space-time quantum mechanical processes. So that's the usual answer. But the question we've been asking is something else. Is there a different question only formulated in the space where the momenta actually live. You know, these on-shell null momenta, they don't live, uh, they don't live inside space-time. They, in a sense, they live on the boundary of uh, Minkowski space if you insist on thinking about them geometrically. But in that space, what is a new question to which the scattering amplitudes are the answer? And if we can understand what those new questions are, um, we should be able to understand how the space-time locality and quantum mechanical unitarity emerges from that answer. 
And cosmology is even worse. Uh, in, in scattering amplitudes, there's a rough notion of a kind of a null time on the boundary of uh, Minkowski space. For, for, for cosmological correlators that only depend on spatial momenta, um, so we can either do them in space or we can go to momentum space. It doesn't much matter. Here I'm drawing a picture in momentum space where some, some cosmological correlator or a piece of the uh, wave function of, of the universe is actually labeled by a bunch of momenta that add up to zero. Once again, that's what we actually observe. And this picture of some process that took place in time is something that in our minds we integrate in in order to give a rational uh, understanding of where these correlations come from. See, in a sense, of course, it's even worse than with amplitudes, or at least you could imagine doing the experiment over and over again. Here the experiment happened once in the deep past. No one was around to see it. We're completely making it up in our heads uh, in order to give a rational description for what actually happened. So here, too, we can ask, could there be something else? Now, just as a function of spatial momenta, uh, nothing could seem more boring <laughs> than just space of spatial momenta. But can you ask a question in the space of spatial momenta whose answer are cosmological correlators or the wave function of the universe? So that's what I'll be talking about in the talk today. So just to be a little more concrete, what is the, the sort of canvas? For both amplitude and momenta, the canvas, the place these objects live, is one way or another of labeling the variables the observable depends on. So if we're talking about scattering amplitudes, it's physical on-shell momenta, or twister variables, or maybe points on the celestial sphere. It doesn't much matter how you talk about it. This part is sort of trivial. You can go back and forth between these uh, different uh, descriptions. In the case of the wave function universe, we're just talking about the spatial future, either in position space or momentum space. But you have to ask, what question do you ask in this space? What ideas sort of breathe physics life into what otherwise seems like an arid and boring place where there's no notion of time, no notion of no locality? Unlike in ADS, once again, I can't just say, put a quantum field theory there. There's nothing obvious that I can do on this space. There's nothing obvious that uh, you can do. But the picture that's been emerging over the last uh, 10 years is that there is something in here after all. And the something is a little alien. It's not totally familiar, uh, but it involves fundamentally combinatorial ideas. So there's something fundamentally combinatorial that's associated to what are called positive geometries that you can actually see in this kinematical space, and certain analytic objects that go along with them, canonical differential forms that ultimately relate to the actual observable. So just to give some rough idea what these, uh, uh, what these notions are, and I'm afraid, given the, the half hour that I have, I'm going to have to be a little impressionistic. But of course, while you guys are all here, I'll be, I'll be happy to explain anything in infinite detail. Uh, so what is a positive geometry? The simplest example of a positive geometry is like the inside of, a, of an interval, or a triangle, or a simplex in a general number of dimensions. More generally, you can be imagined on your inside of a polygon, or a polytope in uh, higher dimensions. So uh, one way of talking about these positive geometries is as a positive linear combination of the external data that specifies the vertices. So a formula that looks like that. So there was a geometric object there. I've skipped the combinatorial step. Um, we'll, we'll, see that, uh, we'll see that when we get to the, uh, to the cosmological example. So this is the geometric idea, is you have some shape like this. Um, but associated with that is an analytical notion. Given one of these shapes, there's a certain differential form that's defined on the space where these things live. And this differential form has the property that it has so-called logarithmic singularities on all the boundaries of this space. So what does that mean? It means that if you have a triangle, so let's say you have a, in a two-dimensional space labeled by x and y, let's say you have this, this triangle, 1. OK? There's a triangle. There, there's a canonical form here, which is a two-form, dx dy over xy, 1 minus x minus y. OK? And this is a form that has the property that it locally looks like dx over x, wedges of dx over x. That's what logarithmic singularity means. Uh, and so because it has that property, you can take a residue of the form. For example, I can take a residue where x equals 0. Okay? Now further, this two form has the property that when you take the residue at x equals 0, the resulting object that looks like dy over 1 times 1 minus y, because you've put x to 0, that object itself has logarithmic singularities at 0 and 1, which are the two, which are the two endpoints on that, on that edge. Okay, so given a geometric shape, 
given a geometric shape, and it's more non-trivial if it's a quadrilateral or higher n gone, given a geometric shape, there's a differential form that is tied to it, is a slave to that shape, with the property that it puts logarithmic singularities on and only on all the boundaries of that object. Okay, so you, you should think of a, this as a canonical way of associating an analytic object with a geometric one. Okay. And the general picture that has been emerging <coughs> in all the examples that we've seen, and now these, these examples started off life in what you might think is a very special place, maximally supersymmetric, uh, Yang Mills scattering amplitudes in four dimensions, but by now we've seen them all over the place. We've seen them in uh, theories of uh, phi cube theory in any number of dimensions, theories of pions and gluons in any number of dimensions. Um, so it has nothing to do with integrability, it has nothing to do with the magic of supersymmetry. There's something, there's something more fundamental about this. Uh, uh, but the, just to give you a general idea, in this d-dimensional big kinematic space, so the space of either momenta or coordinates on the boundary, however you want to talk about it, in this big space, there is a nice subspace, what we call a positive region, P. Uh, the, the observables are associated with lower dimensional, generally speaking, although the cosmological example will be special, we won't have this extra feature but is in general associated with a lower dimensional form that lives in this big d-dimensional space. There's a family of subspaces that, uh, that uh, of the same dimensionality. Geometrically, these family of subspaces intersect this positive region in a shape. That shape is a positive geometry, and the amplitude or the wave function of the universe is the canonical form associated with that positive geometry. So, so roughly speaking, this positive geometry is seen to live in that boundary space at infinity, and the observables are the, the canonical form associated with them. All right, so now let me talk about all of this in the context of the wave function of the universe and actually its relation to scattering amplitudes, because as you'll see, perturbative calculations of the scattering amplitudes contain the wave, func uh, uh, of the wave function of the universe contain scattering amplitudes. So even if you're a person who loves scattering amplitudes, you should love the wave function of the universe more <laughs> because it gives you a little generalization of scattering amplitudes in a quite, uh, in a quite beautiful way. And as we'll see uh, towards the end of the talk, uh, this picture actually gives uh, to me a conceptually much more transparent understanding of some old classic things about field theory, like the cutting rules, the, the uh, unitarity of loop amplitudes in field theory, which has uh, somewhat clever proofs in old books, has a very simple conceptual proof that's provided by this association. With, uh, uh, with cosmology and these objects that we call cosmological polytopes. All right, so, <coughs> so let's begin with some, with some general questions. There are two obvious questions when we talk about uh, cosmological correlators and the wave function of the universe. First, the question Daniel uh, alluded to at the end of his talk and, and is, in a sense, uh, the subject of his talk, okay, is how is consistent unitary evolution physics encoded in these late time correlators without making any reference to the time evolution that they came from, okay? This part one is completely analogous to what, you know, professional amplitude calculators do to use so-called on-shell methods to calculate scattering amplitudes. So that's saying let's, uh, let's only use directly on-shell information and figure out how using that information we can actually calculate and characterize what, uh, what scattering amplitudes are. The analog of that question is the sort of thing that uh, Daniel was talking about in his talk. How directly from the properties that we can measure on the boundary can we determine and see the, uh, the not, not just see important physical properties, but even determine what the correlators are without ever talking about the <coughs> direct bulk calculation. Just like, you know, amplitude professionals calculate scattering amplitudes without summing Feynman diagrams. Okay, so that's the, that's, that's part one. And uh, there's a long way to go to uh, um, understand this uh, perfectly. We don't even understand the analytic properties of scattering amplitudes perfectly. Um, never mind the analytic properties of uh, cosmological correlators and the wave function of the universe. But this is a very well posed, nice set of questions to uh, think about, and there's, there's a lot to be thought about there. But then we can jump to question two, which is sort of more radical than one. Uh, question two is, as we've seen in amplitudes, is there some actually autonomous object that satisfies these rules without having any bulk time evolution? You know, is there some, again, is there some natural question to which the wave function of the universe is the answer that doesn't look anything like that it has time, eta integrals, anything like that? Just some question, some natural object 
uh, that, uh, that uh, computes these, uh, the wave function in, a, in an autonomous way. And having seen it, can we understand where locality, unitarity, other things like that come from? So we're going to talk about a toy model for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, for the wave function. I'm going to talk about a model of a conformally coupled scalar with general non-conformal polynomial interactions in any FRW cosmology. Okay. Uh, in fact, I'm going to talk about something even more general than that. Uh, after we do the conformal transformation to make the kinetic term canonical, I'm really imagining a theory with arbitrary time-dependent coupling constants, but the quadratic piece, the uh, propagator, is time-independent. Okay. This is basically for simplicity, just so we can get get going. Each one of these uh, each one of these couplings can be given a Fourier representation like that, and therefore, in order to solve for the wave functions that we get. It suffices to solve them for these uh, uh, for the couplings that go like e to the i, uh, e eta, um, and then do the Fourier integral at the end. So, so here is an example, just to pick a complicated looking example for something that would give rise to a six-point function. And so, uh, if there are just scalars, you know, all of these propagators that go out to the boundary are just exponentials, e to the i, energy eta. So, because of that. Uh, we don't need to uh, draw all the lines going out to the boundary. So all, everything going out to the boundary is truncated, but here we get the sum of all the energies at that vertex. Okay, um, okay so to begin with, we start with a picture like this. It can have trees, it can have loops, it doesn't matter. Uh, and we end with a graph okay? where, where there are variables associated, energy variables associated with the vertices, energy variables associated with the edges. And finally, the bulk-to-bulk -bulk propagator is just the following familiar object. It has two pieces, the two time orderings from the usual Feynman propagator, and this correction that is there to ensure the boundary condition, since we're calculating a wave function here. So I'm not doing schwinger keldish I'm really just computing the, I'm really computing the wave function. So there's this extra piece that ensures that, that uh, all perturbations vanish at the boundary eta equals zero. Okay? So that's all we're doing. Okay? I, I'm gonna, uh, we take a given diagram, and with these rules, we just have to integrate over all the etas, and we get something. So this is the object that we're talking about. It depends on the graph, depends on variables associated with the vertices, x with the edges, y. And it's just the integral, the product of all the vertices of the, their d etas, these factors that are the bulk to boundary propagators, and these factors that are the product of all the edges of the bulk to bulk propagator. And what I want to stress is that if this was a scattering amplitude, this would be trivial. The answer would just be the product of 1 over the propagators for everybody. But already one diagram in cosmology is very non-trivial because there are order three to the e terms because the internal propagator has three pieces in it. So any concrete calculation of this uh, um, uh, is, uh, looks complicated. I'll show you some examples in a second. Let me just say, when the couplings are eta independent, there's actually there's already a clue that there must be a second way of doing this calculus. The first way is the Feynman path integral way, right? the way that we're used to in cosmology. But if these couplings were eta independent, you know that this object is the answer to another question. It's just the ground state wave function of some quantum mechanics. And therefore, there must be a second way of calculating it, just using old-fashioned perturbation theory. <laughs> okay. Okay. And in fact, there is, a, there is a very pretty way, actually, starting from the Feynman representation to derive this representation that relates to old-fashioned perturbation theory that just tells you a recursive way that the, uh, that the function for this graph is 1 over the sum of all the uh, energy variables associated with the vertices times the sum of going uh, through the graph and cutting every internal line of the product of the two lower pieces with the internal line removed with the energy variable associated with the edge that you remove added to both the vertices that it touches. Okay, so that rule ends up generating old-fashioned perturbation theory, and you can even derive it from the Feynman diagram prescription. Okay, but let's talk about what the final answer looks like in some very simple examples. So that dot there would, for example, just be what we get from a phi cubed interaction or something, but everything is uh, now all the external legs are truncated. So that's just 1 over the sum of the energies, just 1 over x. Remember, at the end, we're going to integrate. This is for the oscillatory couplings. At the end, we're going to do an integral to get the actual final answer um, over the Fourier conjugates of those couplings, so of the Fourier transforms of the couplings in energy space. So you can think of the thing that we're talking about as the integrand of that object. And in flat space, is literally the object itself. Okay. All right. Now, already this thing that would be, for example, what you get from a four-point function, 
um, if you had a phi cube theory. This is three terms with the usual Feynman diagrams, but it collapses to this very simple expression. You'll notice that it's all sums of energy denominators, no minus signs anywhere. This loop diagram is seven terms that collapses to something simple. This thing that might contribute to a five-point coupling, again, is nine terms, but it collapses to this very simple uh, object. Okay? So now we're getting a little more con concrete. When I say, is there an object that could give these eyes out? It's like, is there a question that I can ask in this space whose answer spits out these interesting functions without ever mentioning anything about time evolution or propagators or anything like that? Right. Two more comments. First, the wave function universe naturally contains scattering amplitudes, something I think many, many of you know, but I think it's an absolutely beautiful thing. <laughs> Technically <coughs> very simple, but an absolutely beautiful thing. Of course, when you look at the data that labels a, uh, a cosmological correlator or a piece of the wave function universe, it's just a bunch of spatial momenta that add up to zero. That's exactly the same as the data that labels a scattering amplitude by momentum conservation. The only difference is that when we have really on-shell particle scattering, we also have energy conservation. And we don't have the analog of energy conservation in cosmology, because there's no energy. There's no particles involved. Okay? But what that means is that if you look at some piece of the cosmological wave function, uh, while there's no delta function for total energy conservation, if you analytically continue to allow some of the energies, by, by which really I mean magnitudes of spatial momenta, if you analytically continue to allow some of them to be positive and some of them to be negative, then, then you can find a pole. And sitting on the pole where the sum of a bunch of energies go to zero, the residue on that pole is the scattering amplitude. Okay? And in fact, the choice you made for which guys you made negative and which guys go positive tells you which guys are in and which guys are out in the amplitude. I think this is a remarkable thing, that you're sort of sitting on your back looking at the night sky in principle, <laughs> measuring cosmological correlators, that object contains, I mean, one consistency condition. There are probably many others, but one consistency condition has to satisfy. If the suitable analytic continuation of that sucker had better give you something that looks exactly like a scattering amplitude and, sell, and satisfies all of the non-trivial consistency conditions of the amplitude. Certainly not a random function you crap out is going to do that. Okay, so this is already a, uh, one of presumably many of these uh, consistency conditions on the actual answer that we're going to have to uh, 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 understand. But, and of course, we see this very easily because this pole comes from, the only poles here uh, come from the time integrals going off to infinity. And so there's a, there's a piece where all these vertices go off to minus infinity together. That's the piece that can, that's regulated by the sum of all the energies. So that's the piece that'll have a pole if you send the sum of the energies go to zero. But sitting on that pole, that's dominated by when these vertices all go to minus infinity together. And then they have no idea that the boundary is there at eta equals zero. And that's why the answer is the same as the flat space scattering amplitude. Okay? So cosmological correlators contain scattering amplitudes. <laughs> and they contain, in fact, cosmological correlators, a one variable generalization of scattering amplitudes. I think it's a remarkable, beautiful thing. Given all the magic that we've seen in scattering amplitudes over the last 30 years, it's very, very hard for me to imagine <laughs> that that magic is localized to a co-dimension one <laughs> surface. <laughs> inside the space where the cosmological correlators are well-defined. It's much more likely that that magic extends to something that actually controls the cosmological correlators themselves. All right. All right, so let's just see how this works in some of the examples. So for instance, uh, um, this diagram, remember I, I gave you this answer, 1 over x1 plus x2, 1 over x1 plus y, 1 over x2 plus y. You see, nothing here looks like propagators, nothing looks uh, Nothing looks Lorentz invariant, but if you sit on this pole where x1 plus x2 equals zero, these are these energies. On this pole, the residue is the product of these two things, which, which nicely becomes one over x squared minus y squared, which is nothing than one over f. Okay, so these linear propagators combine together and become quadratic Lorentz, uh, Lorentzian propagators. What about at loop level? If you draw a picture like this, this object uh, sitting on the pole x1 and x2, x1 plus x2 equals zero, now looks like this. It has a piece that looks like a propagator, but now these other two things. You see, this thing could not just immediately look Lorentz invariant because it doesn't know anything about L0, right? Um, the, 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 the time component of a loop integration variable. This thing only knows about spatial loop momenta. So what Lorentz invariant object could it be matching onto? The answer is very beautiful. If, you, if, you, uh, if you're a Feynman, you looked at uh, loop amplitudes a long time ago, and you notice that you can do the L0 integrals trivially just using the I epsilon. 
So there's a very canonical way to go from d4l integrals to d cubed l integrals doing the l0 integral on the i epsilon. That re resulting object is not manifestly Lorentz invariant, but it smells Lorentz invariant because it looks exactly like this. It looks like propagators and things that look like phase space factors. Okay? And so that's what we match on to. We match on to this Feynman tree theorem. <laughs> Do the L0 integrals on I epsilons uh, version of the integrand when we make this connection at, uh, uh, at loop, loop level. OK, <coughs> finally, um, just to end this uh, uh, little introduction, I won't go too much longer, Matthias. Um, in flat space, <laughs> in flat space, uh, the, uh, what? Sorry? Ha <laughs> yeah, ha that's very funny. Yeah. Uh, um, you, d you did not want to ask me that, that question. Do you mean infrared divergences for cosmological correlators or for scattering amplitudes? <laughs> All right, time. OK, yeah. We'll, 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 let's talk about that over lunch. Uh, uh, anyway, in flat space, these rational functions we get just literally give us the vacuum wave function. If you literally take the sitter, then you have to do these energy integrals. And the final, final answer turned out to be, quite remarkably, polylogarithms already. So even if you take a tree diagram, okay, a tree diagram, if you get the final answer, it's, it's a polylog. Now, polylogs show up at loop level when you uh, compute scattering amplitudes. Here they show up already at tree level. Let me give you two examples. So uh, this guy, um, if you do the if you do all the integrals, you're left with a function of the energy variables associated with uh, everything here. And it's a dialog. And there's an object called the symbol that you, you can associate with the polylog that is the kind of fast way of encoding where all the branch cuts are. Um, anyway, the symbol is this interesting looking expression as a function of these variables. Already, this thing that would contribute to a five-point function is pretty complicated. There's like 100 terms in the symbol that look, look like that, if you actually do the direct uh, computation. So you see, the tree objects are these complicated rational functions. Uh, in De Sitter, uh, for the, in flat space, in De Sitter, even trees are these complicated-looking polylogs. Okay, and so now I'm going to tell you in my remaining time that all of these things are actually the answer to some natural, abstract-seeming question that makes no reference to uh, any kind of space-time, time evolution, or Hilbert space, or a wave function, or anything. Okay, and then we'll understand how these features, uh, how these properties uh, come out. And, and you know, um, uh, okay, so um, let me just begin by defining what the object is. Okay, so, and it, uh, so this slide fully defines the object, and then the rest is exposition from uh, here on. So imagine you have a collection of triangles. So if you've suffered through any of my talks over the last 10 years, everything is about triangles. <laughs> So we're going to start and think about triangles in a different way. Um, so imagine you have a collection of triangles. The, the, they're labeled by the vertices A, B, and C. But they have a funny feature. They have the funny feature that two of the, uh, but, uh, so we could just start off with a bunch of independent triangles, but we want to do something more interesting. We want to allow the triangles to intersect each other. We're going to allow the triangles to intersect on their midpoints. Okay, so I'm going to take two different triangles and I'm going to allow them to intersect on their midpoints. And that just means the following thing, that I'm going to allow equations that look like ai plus bi, which would be the midpoint of that if I divide it by 2, equals aj plus bj. Okay, so given two triangles, I'm going to allow them to intersect on a midpoint. The peculiar feature is that I'm going to allow this to happen on two of the sides of the triangle, but not on the third side. Okay? So in other words, I'm going to, I have a whole collection of ABCs, but I'm going to allow equations of the form a plus b equals a plus b, or a plus c equals a plus c, but not b plus c equals b plus c. OK? That might seem a little strange. Let's see. So there are these marked points on each one of these edges. This edge is unfriendly. These two edges are friendly. But uh, you'll just have to believe me for now, and you'll see it at the end. This is this funny looking thing. What does this remind you of? What are, we, what are we familiar with in physics with a threeness where two things are of one kind and one thing is of another? It's exactly the picture of uh, how light cones divide space-time into regions. Okay, so we have a future and a past um, and space-like separated. And future, past are like, are going to end up descending from these two uh, friendly edges and that guy, the space-like separation, is going to end up descending from the uh, uh, un unfriendly one. All right, now, 
a moment's thought shows that, that I, say, I didn't say anything about graphs. But a moment's thought shows that this picture of intersecting triangles is actually naturally associated with a graph. Okay? Because you can think of any, you can think of every individual triangle as like a line segment with two ends. The two ends are the two friendly sides. Okay? So, so two triangles are going to meet on one side is like taking two of these line segments and gluing them along a common vertex. Okay? So a picture of a collection of triangles that intersect each other consistently is like starting taking a bunch of these little dumbbells and gluing to them together in any way you like to make a graph. See, what's interesting about this is it's kind of dual to the usual way you think of a graph, as a bunch of vertices connected by edges. This is really like a bunch of edges connected along vertices. Okay. All right, so each one of these pictures, any way of uh, intersecting all these triangles together, goes along with a graph. So let me draw you uh, a couple of uh, the two simplest shapes. Unfortunately, the first simplest shape, I mean, I can just have a triangle itself, but when I have two triangles, here's one of them, okay? Here's the two friendly sides and one unfriendly side. Here's another one, and you see this unfriendly, this, this is in a third dimension, that vertex in the third dimension, this vertex in some fourth dimension, okay? So this object is already a four-dimensional object. You can think of it as a double square pyramid, because there's a square here with a point here and another point off in some fourth dimension. Okay, so that's the geometric shape that would go along with that graph. Okay, so this is this edge is like that dumbbell, that edge is like that dumbbell, and I glued them together in this way. Okay, there's one shape that's three-dimensional that you can visualize, uh, that one that goes along with this one. This one would tell you here's one triangle, here's another triangle, and they're intersecting on two, both of their friendly edges. So that's what this graph tells you. And so this is the shape, this triangle, that triangle, and if I take the the, the convex hull of all those points, it's a truncated tetrahedron. Okay? So this is the shape that's associated with that graph. Right? Now, already, just from the rules, if I take this graph uh, I, and I label, and I use the variables that are uh, labeling the vertices to label the midpoints and this edge, then naturally, that I get associated with it the following vertices for the triangle itself. So if that's y there, I didn't write it down. That's a midpoint of this one. x1 and x2 are the mid midpoints of these. But the actual vertices of the, of the cosmological polytope are then given by these objects. So for every edge of the graph, you get three vertices. So you imagine there are unit vectors associated with the vertices and the edges. So you get three vertices of the cosmological polytope given by x1 plus y minus x2 x2 plus y minus x1, and x1 plus x2 minus y. Okay? All right. So that's it. Now the claim is that, so where does this polytope live? It lives in a space whose dimensionality is equal to the number of edges plus the vertices of the graph. And now I claim that the canonical form, this sucker, for that cosmological polytope is the weight function associated with that graph. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. So I'm, uh, so I'm doing this in perturbation theory. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I, I should have said this. I, I shouldn't have rushed. I'm doing this in perturbation theory. And so I'm looking at the pieces of the wave function associated with each graph. So this is really primitive right now. It's not remotely as developed as the story with amplitudes, where we have objects that calculate full amplitudes. Right now, I'm giving you a geometric object that captures a single graph, the contribution of a single graph. Uh, of course, of course, of course. That's right. Uh, that, that, that goes into actually getting the correlators uh, by integrating over, uh, by, 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 by using the wave function to get the correlators by integrating over the wave function mod squared. Um, there's actually a polytope that computes the correlators in perturbation theory, but that's, uh, that's one of the works in progress I won't probably have time to uh, talk about. But uh, here I'm just talking for simplicity about the uh, wave function. But anyway, I want to claim that, uh, that, that you draw the graph, you get the polytope, and then this canonical form that I talk about is exactly, uh, it's a form, so after you pull out, it uh, depends on all the dx and dy variables. What it's left with is precisely the, uh, the wave function of the universe. And now I'm just going to make some declarations. There are some natural triangulations of this polytope. If you want to compute the form, a very natural thing to do is to triangulate into pieces. Some natural triangulations of the polytope itself give you the time integral representation summing Feynman, uh, the, the, the Feynman time integral representation. 
If you triangulate the dual of the polytope, so this is, again, uh, things that we've seen in the amplitudes world over and over again. They can triangulate the object and triangulate the dual of the object to give you very different representations of the same thing. If you triangulate the dual of it, you actually directly reproduce the old-fashioned perturbation theory expansion of exactly the same object. So the relationship between the, the two stories are literally point-plane duality. You can see that this object satisfies the uh, Schrodinger equation. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, there are new triangulations that don't look anything like either Feynman diagrams or old-fashioned old perturbation theory, which even give you more efficient um, expressions for the uh, wave function. But I won't have time to uh, talk about that. Um, finally, uh, uh, when you get the final answer in De Sitter, you get these polylogs. Uh, I don't have any time to explain what this slide means. But um, remember, you remember we saw this very complicated looking expression even at uh, five points with like 105 terms in the symbol. This is a one line expression fundamentally in terms of the geometry of the cosmological polytope. You just have to take a certain kind of walk in the cosmological polytope from vertex to vertex to vertex. There are some allowed paths that you're allowed to take. You write down the paths. With each path, there is a canonical piece of the symbol and you just get the whole answer. The whole object is truly one term. Uh, and the seeming complexity is just that it's a slightly high dimensional object. There are many walks that you can take, but it's possible to capture it quite beautifully in a single term. Finally, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Any number of loops, because this is about the integrand. This is all about the, uh, the uh, integrand. Okay? So, so you draw a diagram of trees, loops, anything. What this is taking care of is all the time integrals, if you like, in the usual way of doing things. If you imagine you had something, you first did all the time integrals, and then you'd be left with all the L, spatial L integrals, and all the rest of it. Um, what we're talking about here is what you get at the level of the integrand is what you get uh, um, uh, uh, wh when you finish doing all the time integrals. Except, sorry, except in this uh, De Sitter story, uh, it's, it's about trees, and you finish doing all the integrations to get the polylog. So in De Sitter, it's only about trees. Uh, in De Sitter, it's only about trees. Well, it would be about loops, too, but you get these polylogs, and you still have to integrate over the spatial loop variable. I forgot to ask something. You know, the, the biggest variable that explains the trees. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I can tell you. Yeah, we can have a discussion about uh, factorials. That, that this, this, this whole story that connects combinatorics and geometry with uh, amplitudes and now uh, cosmology, it doesn't violate, really violate, any of this old lore about factorial growth. It's just that those factorials are not complicated. Now, when you say there's n factorial terms, you might think there's n factorial different terms. Roughly speaking, what we're seeing is there's a very small number of objects that control all the n factorial things. But it doesn't change sort of qualitative things about the, the order in which perturbation theory might break down and so on and so forth, uh, as, uh, as certainly as, as far as I know yet. All right, so, um, so finally, just one minute on this uh, topic, um, uh, which I think is uh, conceptually uh, uh, very important and uh, interesting. You see, um, the world is fundamentally cosmological. It's not even flat space. We know that. And, uh, and I certainly emphasize it all the time that you know, even things like Lorentz invariants are broken by cosmology. So they can't be something super duper fundamental, right? Um, on the other hand, it's clear that, uh, and, and also unitarity, right? Uh, there's no, ultimately we're asking these static questions. So there's no obvious role for unitarity in cosmology. There's no obvious role for Lorentz invariance in uh, cosmology. And if you're very naive, you might think that, that means that maybe somehow cosmology deforms or breaks those ideas a little bit in some way. And yet that seems totally wrong, because we know from a huge amount of experience that we cannot mess a little bit with these ideas of uh, Lorentz invariance and unitarity without sending everything to hell. So this has always been an interesting tension in, in my mind. Uh, these notions cannot be there really in cosmology, but they have to somehow be exact nonetheless. So how can both these two things be true at the same time? Now, that's what I want to tell you how that happens in, the in, in, in this example. We're going to see how exact Lorentz invariance and unitarity actually emerge from the cosmological polytope. Because uh, all of the singularities of the correlator uh, correspond to going to faces of the cosmological polytope. Okay, so, uh, so you take a residue on some singularity. That means that you're now on a facet. So we can study the face that corresponds to the, all the energies, the sum of the energies going to zero. That face should give us a scattering amplitude on the one hand. On the other hand, that face is some facet, some simple facet of the cosmological polytope. And we can see what it looks like there. So that's what we've been studying with uh, Paolo Benincasa. I should have said this, all this work 
from last year was with Paolo Benicasa and Alex Posnikoff, and this stuff in progress is with uh, Paolo Benicasa, should be out pretty soon. Yes, yes. Yes. No, I'm not talking about any scattering. First, nothing is scattering here either. I'm talking about the wave function of the universe uh, in a situation where you can measure it, where the universe has got infinitely big and opened up into flat space. Pretty close like our, our universe. That's right. Yes. 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 Uh, no, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about e exactly how the wave function contains in an analytic continuation the physics of scattering in it. That's the, that's the interesting point. Okay, uh, but that's a big consistency condition on the wave function. It needs to do that. If someone hands you a random function, it will definitely will not have that property that when you analytically continue, you find a scattering amplitude. Okay, so that's that's the point. So these things contain in them scattering amplitudes in this analytic continuation. This polytope allows us to see it in a simple way. And so, for instance, at tree level, we saw an example already just for the two to two process. But at tree level, it's very simple to see. On general grounds, you can easily work out what all the facet structure of this object looks like, it's in, in particular the scattering facet. At tree level, you find that this face looks like a simplex. It's as simple as possible. It looks like a simplex. And the canonical form exactly becomes the product of, of two e, two edge variables, one over energies that exactly turns into the product of one over Lorentzian propagators, exactly like we saw before. At loop level, it's not true. It's more complicated than a simplex. And then you can just start doing a calculation where you say, OK, it's more complicated. So I want to triangulate it into pieces. You can do it in many ways. Every way of uh, triangulating it into pieces ends up producing one of those Feynman L0 integrated ex expressions for the scattering, uh, for, the, for the loop amplitude. Okay? So every triangulation of the this, uh, this simplex on the boundary produces a Lorentz invariant loop integrand as Lorentz invariant as, as it could be when you do the L0 integrals on the I epsilon. And in fact, this I don't have any time to explain, but in this whole world of canonical forms and polytopes, we've long known there's this, uh, there's this very canonical Grassmannian-like representation for canonical forms as, as integrals. In fact, it has always amused me that these things looked a lot like integrals that looked that had Feynman I epsilons in them. But in this particular context, when applied to the cosmological polytope, this representation of the canonical forms literally becomes the loop integral with the L0 integrals added. <laughs> And you see the Lorentz invariance absolutely manifestly. Okay, so Lorentz invariance is an emergent feature of the of, uh, of one of the canonical representations of cosmological polytopes. What about unitarity? Unitarity is a purely geometric fact about these cosmological polytopes. It can also prove very easily that when you go, when you're sitting on the scattering facet, when you go to a further facet, you see geometrically that it simply splits into the product of two lower scattering facets and an extra simplex. And that's exactly the factorization that the cutting rules uh, force you to have for unitarity, where the amplitude has got to factorize into a left amplitude, a right amplitude, and the on-shell phase space for the stuff in between. And all three features just come out automatically, out of automatically and naturally, out of the uh, geometry. So that ultimately, I really stress all of this is coming it's all exposition, starting from the basic picture of intersecting triangles. And now you see more literally how this picture of intersecting triangles with the two friendly sides and one unfriendly side really is encoding the uh, physics associated with uh, local and unitary, uh, Lorentz invariant and unitary evolution in space time for cosmological polytopes. All right, so that's it. Um, so we've spent uh, many years understanding at, at, in much greater depth um, uh, combinatorial geometric ideas that underlie scattering amplitudes. And we're just starting to see the same kind of things emerging in, uh, in uh, cosmology. But there's really a long, long way to go. Um, uh, in particular, as I said, this whole story is about one diagram at a time. There should obviously be some larger picture that combines all diagrams together. And in fact, last year, last uh, about, about a year ago, um, we, we found an analog of this picture where there's something one diagram at a time for amplitudes associated with simplices, but there is a larger space in which they glue together into a classic mathematical polytope known as the isosahedron. We strongly suspect that there is some cosmological version of the isosahedron that we should be uh, looking for, and we are, we are looking for. Um, and of course, there's many, many other, other questions. Um, but I want to come back um, uh, uh, to also say that the kind of stuff Daniel was talking about in this talk, I think, is um, 
uh, is also, to me, wide open territory. Uh, you ask me, you know, you, you, if you ask me, uh, what do I know about the analytic properties of scattering amplitudes, at least at one loop, we know essentially everything, in, even in perturbation theory. Two loops, we know a lot, but it starts getting hairy, okay? Um, what is the analog for cosmological correlators? Much more primitive, okay? Uh, so I think both, both of these uh, directions, I, I think, are very interesting to pursue. One of them more, more practical, um, but still using this philosophy of ignoring the bulk, trying as much as possible to determine things from, from the boundary. Uh, the other one is looking for, looking perhaps somewhat more erratically, for these uh, autonomous uh, combinatorial mathematical objects that uh, compute um, these uh, cosmological observables for us. All right, thank you.